So we've been specifically examining Bitcoin, well, because it's the first blockchain. However, the innovation that led to Bitcoin didn't just stop with Bitcoin. No, people look to improve upon or create different alternatives to Bitcoin using blockchain, blockchain technology. These coins that aren't Bitcoin are known as altcoins. So altcoins are different cryptocurrencies than Bitcoin. However, some of them iterate specifically off of Bitcoin. Litecoin, for example, kind of labels itself as a companion to the Bitcoin network. Uh, what they did, they're slightly different. They increased their supply fourfold and reduced their confirmation time to one fourth. So instead of Bitcoin, where a block is ideally being created every 10 minutes, a block is ideally being created every two and a half minutes in uh, Litecoin. Now, Litecoin wasn't the only, was not the only other uh, institution to, or only other projects, excuse me, to iterate off of kind of the creation that was Bitcoin. Um, and some interesting things were tweaked to take uh, cryptocurrency beyond simply having monetary purposes, to create programmable money. And that's where Ethereum comes in. So Bitcoin set out to be a peer-to-peer -peer digital cash system. Many would argue that's what it is. It met that goal. Ethereum's goal is, stated goal is slightly different. Ethereum wants to be the decentralized world's computer. So there's some key differences compared to Bitcoin. Well, the first is block time. The block time for Ethereum, the idea is that developers can build decentralized applications off of uh, the platform. In order to do so, you're going to need a significantly shorter block time to make sure that all of these requests go through. Another cool aspect that really can make for programmable money is something called smart contracts, which can exist on the Ethereum network and other platform-based networks. What smart contracts do, the best example, best real-world example that I've heard is probably a vending machine. So, what you do with the vending machine, you put in money and a specific set of directions, and then a corresponding action automatically happens. No human interaction. This is programmed a certain way, put money in, give it directions, get something out. That's how a smart contract works. So smart contracts are autonomous programs that live on the, uh, the blockchain, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum blockchain, other programmable blockchains, and what they do is they can autonomously execute certain actions based off certain programmed uh, instructions and the amount of money being put into it. So put something out for the smart contract, uh, you put something into the smart contract, it will basically execute a specific set of circumstances and you get an output. You're seeing smart contracts being used a lot in decentralized finance, which is just the exactly what it sounds like. It's an attempt to take traditional financial tools or markets, apply them to decentralized technology and cryptocurrency. Cool thing uh, that's being created is actually stable coins. Stable coins, the idea of stable coins is for them to hold their value and not fluctuate at all. A lot of people are in cryptocurrency for the investment. Stable coins, not about investing. What it is about is providing a safe haven to convert your cryptocurrency into if you're worried about the volatility. So let's say I have a thousand Bitcoin and I'm worried that that price of Bitcoin is going to drop. What I can do is transfer that balance to stable coins, which are usually backed either by cash or assets. Stable coins do their job, exactly what it says, provide a stable value that I could convert to cryptocurrency later on at my choice. Additionally, loans and savings are being applied to uh, cryptocurrency. DAI is a unique, a pretty unique stablecoin that uh, relies on a couple other cryptocurrencies. Um, they are also creating kind of a save, basically a savings account that allows you to gain interest over time, as opposed to your cryptocurrency just sitting there, not making more cryptocurrency. So we already went over block time, the amount of time it takes to, for a miner to find it and put forth a valid block. Bitcoin famously introduced the 10 minute block time 
Compared to the status quo at that time, or the status quo now, transferring money from bank to bank across borders could take about five days. There is an institution known as the Automatic Clearinghouse. It's a three-day turnaround. Uh, you might take, or each bank might take an extra day on their end to process the transaction. So sending money across borders could take anywhere from three days to a week. Sending money across borders using Bitcoin, probably gonna take 10 minutes. That's a huge improvement on the existing financial system, financial transmission. We went over why blockchains aren't free to use. It's basically a spam control mechanism because there's only a certain amount of resources that the network has. The network can't handle unlimited requests. Uh, so you introduce fees to discourage frivolous and excess transactions that might clog up the network. Let's compare credit cards. We already compared cash and cryptocurrency. Let's compare credit cards and cryptocurrencies. I don't like credit cards. I think credit cards are outdated, check, uh, outdated technology that have a litany, just a huge amount of problems. For example, uh, the technology is outdated. If I am paying with my credit card, let's say I want to pay for something online. Um, I do that. All my credit card information gets stored, um, and that credit card could basically be swiped for any amount that the merchant wants, because they have access to pretty much all of my funds. Of course, I can dispute this charge. That's a whole process. This doesn't occur with Bitcoin. Great th uh, the great thing about cryptocurrency is you're not providing an opportunity for someone to take advantage of you. You're providing a certain amount of cryptocurrency as opposed to just handing, over some, handing your wallet over. Uh, I love to use this example for uh, when illustrating credit cards versus cryptocurrency. When you hand over your credit card to a merchant, you're basically saying, here, take my money. You're charging me $5. I have $200 in that wallet. Take my $5 and give me back the other $195 because I trust you. Um, obviously, that's not ideal because you might be in a situation where somebody takes that whole $200. That's what somebody can do with your credit card. They can just swipe it for as, many, uh, for as much as they want. Cryptocurrency, you're sending a specific amount of funds. Not going to be overcharged. You can't be double charged. This cuts down on middleman fees. Another part of credit card technology that's really very inconvenient for those who have small and medium-sized businesses that rely on consistent cash flow. Let's say off a no fault of your own, somebody makes a purchase using a stolen credit card. Um, you're out of that inventory, that product that you sold um, because that person bought it and you lose that value uh, because the credit card company is gonna come in, take away the funds that were used to purchase and give it back to its rightful owner. So merchant basically is out of luck. Cryptocurrency, there's no such thing as these chargebacks. Once, uh, once a transaction is done, it's final. The only way to undo the transaction would be to add an opposite transaction at the end of the blockchain. So sending your friend $13, your friend would have to send $13 back to you. 